Hello and welcome to Street Check, the best podcast in the history of Cabot Wealth Network, which has been in business since 1970, delivering insights, investment insights, research, and ideas uh, for more than 50 years. I'm Chris Preston, uh, Editor-in-Chief here at Cabot Wealth Network. And as you can see with me, Brad Zimmerman, my usual co-host, is not with me today. He is in Japan with his family, so I'm sure he's enjoying that. So instead, stepping into his place, back by popular demand, is Michael Brush, who is chief analyst of our Cabot Cannabis Investor um, uh, Advisory. We touched on cannabis a lot about a month ago when you were here, Mike, Michael, and we'll get to that in a bit. But you, you know, cannabis isn't your only area of expertise. You write for Market Watch, um, and you've had some uh, pretty interesting pieces that I've re uh, read in the last few weeks that I wanted to <clears throat> to touch on uh, just sort of high level market stuff. And I found myself nodding along with, with both of them, especially uh, I'll start with the one you wrote, I guess it's end of September. Yeah, that's better than nodding off. Yeah, not nodding off, nodding along. Um, six reasons, you wrote six reasons the bears are wrong. I'll let you talk about some of those reasons. Um, at pretty much since you wrote, it, it's noteworthy, maybe a week after that is when the, at least the temporary market bottom happened. Um, well, it's pulling back a little now. Tell me why you think <clears throat> sort of the, the bearish sentiment that's out there is, is overblown right now. Okay, well, um, I think it's key to always uh, look at the other side of the argument when you're investing. I'm bullish on the market now, but you want to understand fully the other side because they might be right, and even sometimes they are. But um, so in this column, we broke down the, uh, you know, kind of the six big bear cases and... Uh, I don't really think any of them really add up. Um, there is one thing that concerns me, Washington, D.C. and the budget issue, uh, you know, now that it looks like we'll be funding two wars. But, um, but yeah, we just went through the, uh, you know, the major uh, bear cases. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the ones that's been circulating is this idea that consumers are running out of savings, so, right. so the economy will stall. That was a big one. We don't hear that as much now, but that was, that'll come back. Um, but the uh, uh, but the uh, the household net worth rose in the uh, in the second quarter to to 150 trillion, which is a lot of money. It was up four percent. Right. So and then also, I think the key thing behind consumer spending is uh, you know is the jobs market, and the job jobs market remains quite strong. Uh, you know, we're beginning like 250k new jobs a month. That's kind of been the average and. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, and embedded in that is the um, is the idea that the wage gains are not uh, are not as strong as they used to be, and that sort of kills off. That's a whole other conversation, which maybe we'll get to, but that sort of kills off the wage price spiral uh, worries. So, and then the um, the second one, I think, especially today, it might be coming back, is the price of oil. So, um, you know, it's it's it was in the low ninety range, and it's it's. It was 89 this morning, depending on which oil you look at, but basically that was it. And um, I don't think this is a risk either, because we saw when when Russia invaded Ukraine, oil was up in the 100 to 110 range for a good six months, and that didn't really uh, create the problem. I mean, the fear is that it'll, um, you know, it'll create a recession because energy gets more expensive, and it also drives prices up, which will make the Fed more aggressive. But we didn't see that play out, and so uh, I kind of don't think it will uh, uh, yeah. if, if, if it goes up again. So those would be two. We have others, but uh, those would be two of the top ones. Yeah, and you know a lot of the, the stuff I've been looking at that's, that's given me encouraged. Um, you know, Ryan Dietrich, who uh, is a really good market historian for I believe Carson Research Group. I've cited this stat uh, at least I did on last week's podcast. I think um, so. The last there's been nine times since I think. 1980, something like that, where the S&P was up double digit percentage in the first half of the year, and then was down in both July and August, which is exactly mm -hmm. what happened this year. Right. All nine times, it was up in the fourth quarter of that year by an average of 9%. Now, doesn't guarantee it'll happen a 10th time. But, you know, as we know, October is traditionally where market bottoms happen. It happened last year. Um, so I think, from a market perspective, I guess just, you know, market historian and technical perspective, there's a lot to be encouraged about. Is that sort of part of your calculus at all, too? 
Yeah, I think so, because, uh, you know, October is always a weird month. People always say it's September because I guess statistically the declines are a little more, but the bottom, uh, Jason Gepfer, who's a good uh, technical analyst, points out that the bottom for the market historically occurs on yesterday, October 12th. And so who knows, yesterday might be the bottom. But October is sort of this spooky month and um, it's not really clear why. I think there are two reasons. I think when the weather changes, people go into harvest mode and you know savings mode. And so they're more apt to take profits and want to see more cash in their accounts. Um, and then the other thing is there's, uh, you know, the institutional investors have until the end of October to do the tax loss selling. And so that's when a lot of it happens here. Um, and so, uh, you know, then we get into the seasonally strong time of the market, which is November, December, and then the first couple of months of the year as new money flows in. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think um, an interest, speaking of stats, um, I think 35 of the last 5% declines ended in October um, wow. since, uh, and then the next month is 23. So, um, so October is the bear killer month. And uh, I think yeah. that's another reason to be, you know, to be buying any weakness here. I think that makes a lot of sense. What about you? What's your favorite bear case that you like to refute? You got any? <laughs> well, you know, one thing I, I, I think that, I've looked back that at least not this century century, and you know, dating back even further than that is new bear markets is which we entered in what May, May is when we hit the 20% levels, I think around then new bear markets, almost oh. never up in fizzle, you know, like right. a correction like we've had the last couple of months is, is pretty normal. Um, but they never so, for the first year or two, they almost never just disappear we're not going to go right back to a bear market no you know um right. so that, that that's one reason and also as you've discussed and uh, i think we'll, we'll get into the other piece you mentioned about you know bond yield fears being way overblown i i, I think you know the the recession fears it's i feel like it's convenient people are bringing up that's still possible recession or bringing up that you know, inflation being high now, where those weren't issues a few months ago when stocks were humming, when those numbers were worse, when more Fed rates, Fed rate hikes were on the horizon, right. and when recession fears were maybe uh, still a little more real than they are now. It's just a convenient excuse now, but I don't think people will be saying that in a month or two if stocks are higher. Right, right. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's always interesting coming out of bear markets. I've been mm -hmm. doing this for a while. People come out bruised and battered and they're yeah. emotionally beaten up and they haven't. They're looking at some big losses in some of their positions because we just went through a bear market and nobody sells the top. And so um, uh, and people tend to always fight the last war. Um, so I don't like this whole inflation thing. It really sort of mystifies me, because if you take out rent, the CPI and the core CPI are at 2%, which is the target. Okay, so rents matter. A lot of people pay rent, right? But um, that's not so bad. I mean, the uh, if you look at Zillow and some other private sector measures, you see rents going up around 3%. One of them has, uh, I think it's apartments.com, or I don't remember exactly, but yeah. they have it at, at, at declining rent, at new on new leases. Um, so uh i don't know i mean i don't think inflation is really such a big issue anymore but uh, obviously people disagree with me so i could be wrong but uh yeah I, I mean you know i think the market is is kind of telling you that the concerns are starting to ease where you know the so the cpi number number came in i mean slight like 0.1 percent higher right right even that that 0.1 percent beginning of this year end of last year might have you know prompted a one two percent pullback on the day and that didn't happen um, right, you know, right. it is down a little bit the last couple of days we're not seeing panic uh, it seems like a lot of this is baked in already i think that's right and i think um the i think the real insight from yesterday's action was the, the, you're, you're right you're absolutely right the market did handle that little bit above expectation inflation numbers so the market does seem to be adjusting to inflation but then it sold off when um, when the headlines hit that uh, Scalise might not be getting the votes that he expected for uh, House right. Speaker. And uh, 
I really think that's one of the core issues right now. This one's a little harder to refute because, you know, the bond market is saying to the government, you know, you need to get your act together. We don't want another downgrade. Um, you have a huge amount of supply coming on the market. And the, the, by the way, the Fed is getting out of bonds too. And uh, we're not so sure that you're uh, actually fiscally responsible anymore. And we have this uh, November 17th deadline looming. Um, so I think that's the issue. And that's a little bit of a harder one to refute because it is true that, you know, the political situation is kind of out of control. I mean, it's sort of yeah. gone down to lowest common denominator, uh, which is, uh, you know, which is never a good place to be. Um, and uh, rather than, you know, really focused on addressing the issues. so. Um, yeah. yeah, that one's a little tough to argue against, uh, but uh, I don't know, maybe we'll have a government shutdown and that'll, that's a good, that'll be the good news. That'll pressure uh, sure. politicians to actually do something meaningful. Yeah. Right. Um, and, you know, one in your bond piece, one of the things you wrote is 10 year bond yields are not really that high, historically speaking. Right. Um, you know, simply move back to the four to five percent that we saw 2003 to 2007 when Times were good for stocks, at least until 2007. Um, right. You know, it, the S&P was up 80% during that time. So it, right. it, that's one of your reasons for it being overblown. The other is, you know, the fact that sentiment is so weak. This our Mike Santolo, who um, runs our Cabot Growth Investor Advisory, has been saying this. He loves how bad sentiment is right now because that usually... Right immediately precedes uh, a big run-up, um, often off unexpected run-up in, in the market. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I watch sentiment really closely. And sentiment's a tricky thing to interpret because uh, everybody wants to be a contrarian, but it's really hard to be a like to be a true contrarian because that means when everybody is, every signal in the universe is telling you to get out of stocks, you buy. And um, that's not easy to do because uh, who wants to think they're smarter than the crowd? You know, that's, that's a tough case to make. Um, but but so uh, so we do, you know, we all look for negative sentiment and I follow about a dozen of the indicators. I'm not going to drag us through all of them, but I think uh, the one that I like to boil things down to is the investors intelligence bull bear ratio. And uh, this one's on a scale of one to five. And when it goes below two, it's a pretty clear uh, uh, buy signal for the market. That means uh, uh, a low proportion of bears, uh, bulls, sorry, to bears, because it's bulls yeah. over bears, that's right. the ratio. Yeah. Um, and it was down, uh, like for the, f this week, it went above two, it's a two, one, three, but for the prior two weeks, it was at one, eight, three and one, seven, seven. And that's, that's when I was writing those pieces that you're talking about. And that was, I mean, the market has rallied since then. So sentiment came up quite a bit in the most recent week. Um, and, uh, but it's still, I think, I mean, the put call ratio was well above one. Uh, so that was, that's another one I follow. So yeah, I think sentiment's dark enough to, to buy. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of buying, are there, we'll get to cannabis, which is what you write about for, for Cabot in a second. Right. Uh, aside right. from cannabis, are, are there sectors in, in particular that you like right now? Um, you know, what's getting hit the hardest is where I would go. And uh, as long as you, you have can make a reasonably good case that we're not going to get a severe recession, which, you know, kills almost everything except right. for the super defensive. So it would be the cyclicals. So it would be, uh, uh, you know, materials, industrials, consumer mm -hmm. discretionary, um, th those kinds of names. And then uh, beyond that, I look for, uh, you know, I tend to gravitate to the ones where the uh, insiders are buying. Um, I, I like uh, I like Crocs right now, the ugly shoemaker. There's a pretty yeah. good insider buy signal there. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of other retailers I like. Uh, and uh, energy. I think energy still looks really attractive, even as those names have come up, because I don't see oil putting in a big retreat. And, um, uh, you know, it could spike, uh, given given the uh, unfortunate uh, uh, events that are going on. Yeah. Um, but uh, and and a lot of these energy stocks are still at like mid single digit PEs, which is sort of sort of weird, you know, given given the outlook for uh, what I think is a bullish outlook for oil. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like the market is not believing that the price that oil has risen to is sustainable. But now, given you know what's happening in the world, maybe they'll start becoming more believers because. Um, yeah, you know the whole ESG thing. Um, 
kind of blotted out energy and energy like fossil fuel has gotten such a bad name that yeah. uh, the energy companies uh, really kind of just stopped investing and uh, a lot of these projects take a couple of years to come online and so you know so when you stop when you really roll back investing for a couple of years that that hits future production um i think the one risk factor is the shale producers in the us because they've shown uh, capital discipline but um they could break out of that at any moment and over invest again because uh, they could, they can do rapid turnaround the shale you can bring on a lot quicker and uh if they lose their discipline and start going for the quick easy profits that could uh bring down the uh the price of oil uh, quite a bit but so far they're not they're in this sort of return of capital mode through uh, buybacks and dividends. Uh, so right. uh, yeah, I think energy stocks look pretty interesting here. Yeah. And, um, and, and yield, by the way, because because of the right. treasuries going up so much, a lot of the yield names, uh, I just wrote a piece on, uh, on closed end funds that are, you know, there's like five or six of them that are yielding 10%. And they don't look like they're going to tank. Uh, if you look at what they hold, uh, yeah. So, so, the, so I think yield is interesting now too, including the bond, the like TLT, the the ten year bond, or uh, that exists a little longer duration. But yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's get to cannabis. Uh, obviously, that's uh, cannabis. what you write about. What you write about for Cabot with uh, Cabot Cannabis Investor, uh, you right. performed uh, the index, uh, the New Ventures uh, Cannabis Index this year. Right. Um, you wrote this week about. You know, there's still being huge catalysts out there. Now, for those who don't know, there was a big run up, um, you know, after cannabis stocks have been beaten down for what, two, two and a half years. End of August, was it, uh, when the uh, FDA uh, and the um, HH, HHS, am I saying right, that right? Right, right. Um, yeah, Health and Human Services. Yeah. Health and Human Services uh, recommended rescheduling uh, cannabis from being a Schedule One drug uh, in there, lumped in there with what heroin lsd some of the worst drugs you can think of to a schedule three which means right. this is less harmful um that really moved the index for the first time in in a long time uh the stocks cannabis stocks were up about close to 60 percent uh more depending on you know what you're investing in over the course of about two weeks late august early september it's given up about half those gains maybe a little more but you think that um that you know we're 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 ready for another run up um and there's the potential catalysts out there are the biggest one obviously is rescheduling getting approved by the DEA but there's also other catalysts out there safer banking getting approved which seems less likely right. um what do you think will be the thing that that sends cat or cannabis stocks up again that's a pretty good summary i'm afraid you're going to take my job yeah, sorry, I, I probably went too long on that. No, 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 that was that was. I mean, that was it. You hit on the uh, the really kind of the two main issues. Um, I think the big one is this uh, rescheduling because uh, uh, I think I'm pretty sure that's imminent. I don't know how imminent it could. Like people saying by the end of the year, yep. I kind of think it might happen a lot sooner than that. But I don't yep. know that. Um, but I'm sort of getting signals from people in Washington that it could, uh, you know, it could happen a, a lot sooner than that. And uh, this is the big one because uh, what will happen next is the DEA will publish its proposed rule on on the uh, on the, the rescheduling down from down from one to three, and um, and that'll hit the Federal Register. You don't need to track it, the, the Register, because the media will pick that up and report it, you know, within right. thirty seconds. So um, so that'll that'll probably send the stocks up to the previous highs for this year. So for something like uh, MSOX, which is the leveraged ETF, it's oh. trading at about, uh, it's been bouncing around this morning at about 425 to 460. And, um, you know, that could go back up to seven easily. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in a heartbeat. So I think that's a really interesting trade right now. The unleveraged version, if you want a little less volatility, is MSOS. Um, right. So so they'll publish that rule, a uh, proposed rule, and then there will be a big rally. And that's if you're a trader, that's a, a sellable rally. I don't know where, and that's always a hard call, but because uh, then uh, there'll be you know like a 90 day, I think it's 90 day, maybe a 60 day comment period, and. Uh, and ultimately, the, um, the the DOJ, the, the Department of Justice, will uh, 
issue the final rule. The DEA is inside the DOJ, and people are saying they'll do that by you know spring or summer, and that would that would create another rally. Um, so that that'll be the big one to watch. And uh, I mean, who knows if it's going to happen? Nobody really knows what they're going to do. But there's a lot of political pressure from Biden on down to to make this change, and it sort of makes sense. Whatever you think about cannabis, um, it shouldn't be above uh, fentanyl. No. You know that doesn't make any right. sense. Um, you know, it got stuck in Schedule One in the Nixon era when Nixon wanted to go after the favorite drug of his major political opponents or many of them. And yeah. so uh, it's kind of lingered there ever since. You know, people have mixed views on cannabis, and I do too, personally, you know, on, in terms of like, you know, usage. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you could have the same debate about alcohol. You could have the same debate about a lot of the prescription drugs uh, people take. And so, uh, you know, ultimately, I think we're in a country where we, we want to celebrate individual choice and freedom and liberties. And so, um, you know, to, just from that point of view alone, it makes sense to me to, uh, to down schedule it. Um, yeah. And so that's the big one. Yeah. Explain why rescheduling is from a practical standpoint, why it's right. so important for the industry just in terms of um, as a business, the can business of cannabis. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, that, uh, the answer to that is taxes, because there's an IRS code that says if, if you sell a Sked 1 drug, you can't deduct expense, uh, expenses against that revenue. And uh, so, you know, these cannabis companies are paying, you know, like a 75% tax rate, which is crazy. Right. Um, and uh, huge amounts of money uh, uh, that they could be reinvesting, uh, which is what they would do. They would, they're not going to be paying dividends because they're in growth mode. Um, so that's a big one. Um, but I think also on a symbolic level, it would have a huge impact because I've been describing what I call a cultural momentum in this country. I think in investing, it's always important to look for big, big waves of change to to invest in that have a lot of momentum and are going to probably continue. Like you can think of like demographic trends and so forth. Um, uh, right now, maybe reshoring would be one, you know, getting moving out of China production back here to the US. That's that's still an investable theme. But um, but cannabis, like last week or two weeks ago, there was a nursing group that that agreed to uh, suggest that uh, cannabis should be uh, use of cannabis as medicine should be or is a, a nursing specialty. And that's a group that has 5 million people across the country. It's not like all uh, liberals in on the coast, you know, and so um, Right. So I think, uh, you know, I think the cultural momentum, I love documenting them in the letter because like, you know, the sports leagues uh, taking cannabis off the list of drugs to test yeah. for, it's just like, it's there. And so if the, if the feds uh, down schedule, um, you know, that'll be a reinforcement of the cultural momentum. And it'll also indicate that at the federal level, it'll be like a ice, you know, like an ice block breaking and probably telling us more changes coming. So right. I think I think that's the importance of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, the, you know, the the other major potential catalyst out there seems less likely, as you've written, the Safer Banking Act. Yeah. Basically give cannabis companies access to banking, which they don't, you know, right. use credit right. cards, which they don't really have now in the U.S. Um, that seems it sounds like it is a is a chance it'll get through the Senate, but the House less likely, especially yeah. depending on who they nominate as their speaker. Yeah, exactly. Um, the Senate, uh, uh, Todd Harrison, who's a pretty astute cannabis investor and commentator, uh, he's been saying that'll get approved uh, by, you know, in a month, basically, by the Senate. Yeah. Um, so that'll be, that'll create a rally, but uh, I think that's definitely going to be a sellable rally. And for the reason you stated, um, it's, you know, the conservatives are less favorable to change here, and so they control the House. and. Uh, under the pri the prior speaker, it had a shot, but um, you know the two top candidates now have a, have a very negative voting record on cannabis. So I mean, who knows going to be who's going to be the speaker? And plus, the House has a lot of issues on its plate now. Suddenly, with um, you know with the geopolitical turmoil and uh, the budget issues, so uh, you know they only have so much bandwidth. So yeah, I don't think uh, I mean there are people who argue Don Murphy a lobbyist. He, he, there are people who argue it has a chance in the house. I don't really believe that, but who knows? It might. Um, so, but you know, there are other kettles to watch too. You know, that'll play out. Yeah, I know. In Europe, uh, was it Germany? Uh, right. Legal, yeah. Um, right. Yeah, uh, and or, there's others you've written about. It's several. It's not just Germany, right? Well, um, 
Germany is really pushing ahead, which is interesting because uh, they'll be they'll create the template for legalization and uh, they're pushing ahead gradually, slowly, you know, a lot slower than people thought, but it's happening. But a, another near term one is Ohio. It's on the uh, legalization of oh. recreational use. They already do med use is on the uh, ballot in, uh, you know, just around the corner in November. And uh, I kind of think that's going to pass. It'll be close, but the, but the polling suggests there's enough support to hit the uh, uh, 60% level of, of voter approval. And Ohio is a big state and it'll put pressure on Pennsylvania, which is kind of teetering, uh, you know, because then Pennsylvania will be surrounded by states that, that legalize. and. Uh, They'll, they'll be able to smell it across the border. Yeah, they'll, they'll tempt yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'll be wafting down from New York because right. uh, there's a lot on the streets here in New York. Uh, people are complaining about that. But um, but yeah, so that's a catalyst. And then you have uh, uh, on November 8th, the Florida uh, Supreme Court will hear oral, oral arguments on their referendum. And, uh, you know, who knows, that might produce uh, kind of a bullish tone or it could be a bearish tone. Um, yeah. Florida, you know, Florida is tricky. They... Uh, uh, the court has a conservative leaning, and so it, it you might think it has a natural bias against approving uh, a referendum that would bring out the liberal vote, and in fact, that's probably true. So so that one's still up in the air. We don't really know where that's going to go, but they have to decide by April uh, whether they approve the language of the referendum or not, and so uh, there's a pretty tight time timeline on that potential catalyst. I kind of think it's going to go through, but we don't know. Yeah, I mean, all told... Uh, bottom line, a lot of catalysts, potential catalysts out there. And so it sounds like buying now is a good idea, especially if, you know, as you mentioned, if safer banking were to get approved in the Senate, you'd want to own now for that, even though there might, it might be immediately sold off. Um, right, right. But, um, yeah, yeah, so M MSOS is right now, it's at 707 and MSOX is at 439. I think those are good entry points, you know, it, those things yep. bounce around quite a bit. So I wouldn't yep. buy in just one swoop, but. Uh, uh, and those both are, are at kind of support level, MSOX in particular is right around recent support. I think so, yeah, I think so. If you look at the chart, they do look like support. I don't think we're going back to the prior lows, but, right. but uh, yeah. uh, it's possible, but I don't see that happening. Right. Yeah. And MSOX, as you mentioned, a leverage fund, you know, I, I said cannabis stocks are up 60 percent or so in a couple of weeks, late August, early September. MSOX was up double that, but 120 percent more. Uh, yeah, that's a crazy one. That that has big intraday volatility. I mean, if you if you're a gambler slash trader, uh, <laughs> there's a fine line, um, you know, yeah. That's an interesting vehicle right there. And, but you got to watch too, there's a, there's a pretty big bid ask spread. It's uh, 38 by 42 cents. I mean, that's pretty wide. It's usually a little wider than that. So, you know, you got to be careful how you buy that because um, the market makers, you know, they're, they're basically being greedy. They're keeping a big bid ask spread because they profit on that. Um, so, yeah. you know, uh, limit orders is really yeah. the way to go. Yeah, well, um, if you want access to all the cannabis stocks that Michael is recommending now, I, I highly recommend uh, taking out a subscription to uh, Cabot Cannabis Investor. You can find it on the CabotWealth.com uh, page. We're under a premium advisories. We have a tab, just pull it down and list all our advisories. As I said, Michael's outperforming uh, the index this year, and it's especially the last couple of months have been a good time to be in cannabis stocks, and it sounds like there's going to be even better times ahead potentially. Um, Michael, thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure discussing uh, scatter shooting around the market. Um, yeah. Any can, final can I words? Just, yeah. Can I just add the, on the letter, um, you know, we offer the stocks, but uh, uh, we also get into a lot more nuance on the, yeah. the timing and the probability of catalysts and, and the other potential catalysts. And uh, all that stuff is really important for or anybody who's either trading the sector or, or wants to, you know, uh, average into longer term positions. So um, I think that's in a really important part of the letter. Yeah, you you were impressed with how much I knew about cannabis. It's simply from reading your newsletter, including this week's newsletter. Uh, it's it's the benefit of being editor in chief. I get to see everything that comes in. I learn I learn a lot. So um, it, I'm just regurgitating what you wrote basically to you. Um, but yeah, it, it the educational aspect of it and just everything you say about potential catalysts and what's going on in the industry is really valuable. Um, and then, you know, the stocks in there are also 
uh, for people to choose, pick and choose from uh, what they like, um, stocks and ETFs. Um, but thanks, uh, Michael, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for joining me this week. Um, Brad will be back next week. In the meantime, uh, give us a like, subscribe, five-star rating. That's what keeps us going here. And we will be back with another episode of Street Check next Friday.